Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming this afternoon. I know it's been a long day, but we have one more great session for you. Um, for those of you who we may have missed at the door, we are doing a drawing at the end of the session for an iPad Mini 3. So if you don't have one of these wonderful little cards, throw up your hands now or forever hold your peace. And just one more time, this is session seven. There we go. There we go. Okay, now we're ready to go. There we go. The, the, the we'll, bunch we'll, of hands. We'll collect them all. The yeah. bunch of hands there as well. Oh, the, all these hands. Okay. <laughs> Do me a favor. It's like being at a baseball game. Pass the hot dog down to the guy in the seat next to you. We've got more over here. Did we run short? Okay. We'll get him. We'll get you. Laura. Uh, uh, Laura will get you in the back there. Um, again, thanks for coming Come, uh, to the Cisco breakout room this afternoon. This is our last session of the day. Uh, my name is Gary. I'll be your host. Um, seriously, I'm very quickly going to introduce Dave uh, McCowan, who's going to be talking about securing your OpenStack private cloud, technical lead, and the OpenStack team at Cisco. And Dave, with that, I'll let you get underway and introduce your co-presenter. All right, great. So as Gary said, my topic is securing your OpenStack cloud, and I'm going to do an overview of lots of different uh, security techniques, because when you're designing and deploying a cloud, you want to have defense in depth and cover as many um, different techniques as you can. In case one fails, you've got a backup. And my co-presenter, um, uh, Raghu Guluri, will uh, uh, come up at the end. I'll introduce him later. So if you've hit some of the other presentations in this room earlier today, you've seen uh, presentations covering um, building your OpenStack cloud, using your OpenStack cloud, and connecting your OpenStack cloud. And I'm talking about securing your OpenStack cloud, so we're going to talk about techniques and, and tools to do that, uh, covering all three of these silos. Uh, so to introduce, first, uh, to have this conversation, we sort of need to have a shared framework and a shared vocabulary to define what is securing your OpenStack cloud. And uh, so a traditional way to talk about it is to take your cloud and divide it into security domains. And traditionally, there's four uh, security domains that make it easy to talk about. Uh, the first domain on top is the external domain. So this is where your cloud users and your project administrators live. And it's also where the rest of the world live, all the unauthorized users. So uh, this is a section of the cloud where you know the bad guys are. And see, to, uh, to enter your cloud, you want to have uh, a strong set of APIs to, um, to, to protect the, the entrance of your cloud. Uh, so below that in yellow is the tenant API. So this is where the, uh, the virtual machines that are launched, the instances live. This is where your cloud users live. And you want to have your cloud users to be able to run inside your instances and also to communicate between their instances, but not impact the instances that are owned by others' users inside the cloud. So that's, uh, that's what that uh, security domain is about. And then to the right, the, the green box, is the data domain. This is where the users store their data um, in the storage nodes. And you want to have users to be able to access their data and not be able to access other users' data. So that's what we're concerned about in that security domain. And then in the bottom, the, in the orange, that's the cloud operators. That's the management and the control plane. And you want this layer to be invisible to all the other users. And you certainly don't want to have um, non-cloud operators be able to impact that domain um, in any way. So that's the one you really need to lock down and protect. And then if, uh, basically, if your cloud is secure, then everybody's going to stay inside their box. And um, the, the goal in that case to keep people inside the box is to mitigate these attacks or mitigate these breaches of people breaking out of their box. So when we look at the external domain, this is our API endpoints and our web dashboard. Um, so we want to be able to let the good guys in and keep the bad guys out. And some different techniques we can use to, uh, to, to make that happen is, of course, we're using TLS, uh, we're using HTTPS to, to authorize and encrypt user access. Uh, we may want to put some web filters or uh, rate limiting um, in front of the, those endpoints to prevent uh, denial of service attacks. Um, when we're looking at our data domain, what we're protecting there is information leakage. We don't want user data to escape the cloud um, in different ways. And uh, some ways to protect that is to use TLS to access that domain, and then also encryption. If the data is encrypted when we're inside the cloud, even if somebody walks off with a hard drive, they still haven't walked off with any data. So there's some security tools there. And then in the yellow domain we talked about, the tenant domain, um, that's also a sensitive area, especially in a public cloud. You don't necessarily personally know the tenants using your cloud, so you've got to protect um, that those tenants stay within their assigned area. 
and we can use various <coughs> techniques for that of service hardening, mandatory access controls, and by providing the code that they actually run um, inside that domain. And then when we talk about defense in depth, we're talking about secondary attacks. If somebody is able to breach out of their box into another box by deploying techniques such as least privilege and mandatory access controls and encryption everywhere, um, we're going to prevent, uh, minimize the breach if somebody is able to access an area that they're not, uh, they're not supposed to. And uh, so using this as a framework, let's deep dive into a couple of these techniques. Um, so OpenStack, uh, of course, is an open source software project. So if we want to build a secure cloud, we need to start off from the very beginning by doing some secure programming. And so it's an open source package. Um, some of our brothers and sisters in the open source world have gotten some bad press lately. And I think you know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, OpenSSL has gotten hit with Heartbleed and Poodle. Um, you know, Bash got hit with Shellshock. Uh, just last week, uh, some hypervisors um, were affected by Venom. Um, so the question that we as a community should be asking together is how can we as a community reduce, reduce the risk of this happening to OpenStack? You know, how do we not have a logoed vulnerability um, happen in OpenStack? And um, so to answer that question, let's do a little bit of research on some of the other uh, recent vulnerabilities. Um, so here's a little snippet. Uh, I went to GitHub and, and pulled out this code. And this is a patch that fixes a vulnerability. Um, if you look at the second line there, basically what that's doing, they added a conditional to say, if I don't have two bytes in this payload, let's not copy two bytes out. And then a few down, a few lines later, there's another conditional that says, hey, if I don't have these bytes in this packet, don't copy that out. And the comment is, is most interesting because it says, you know, silently discard if I don't have enough space per the RFC. So the designers of this protocol thought about this possible security vulnerability, but the guy who wrote the code didn't implement that. So does anyone know which vulnerability this is? Yes, that, that's Heartbleed. And it was just a couple lines of code fix. It was really simple, and it's, it's a tenant that we should all practice as programmers, and that is validate your input. And this is an example of the, the implementers of OpenSSL of the Heartbeat protocol did not validate the input. Um, so here's another example, uh, you know, right from GitHub. GitHub. Uh, same type thing. The, uh, um, the control block went down into the kernel uh, to access this control block, and it had a value data pause in it. And the code didn't double check that value, and so the user could provide a value that was, you know, too big. So isn't C beautiful? Isn't that? <laughs> um, anyway, so down there, there's a modular division that makes sure that pause doesn't get too big for the sector length. And, and this is the fix for Venom. And again, it was just a couple lines of code, and it was just a very simple fix, and a, basically a violation of a tenant. Validate your input. It's as simple as that. So if we learn something from these other vulnerabilities, let's learn one thing. Is if we have a checklist, uh, of secure programming practices, you know, let's put on it, validate input. And the good news is we don't have to stop with, uh, with a checklist of one, as the, uh, the great guys in the OpenStack security team of OpenStack has put together actually a pretty long uh, checklist for us of uh, secure programming practices with details. And uh, just this week, uh, the content moved from a wiki page to the, uh, the <coughs> proper uh, security openstack.org website. At the bottom of that page, there's a list of uh, programming practices. And on it, you'll see things like uh, validate the input from users, uh, logging guidelines. Right? If you're writing some code and you happen to know the password of the administrator, don't put it in a log. No one needs to read that. Uh, or if you have the authentication token from Keystone, just because you know it, you don't need to log it. Um, uh, follow these guidelines will help secure your cloud more. Um, there's also some other guidance around secure defaults. Uh, if you're adding some configuration values and you have to choose what default uh, to use, you know, choose the most secure to be your default, and that will help the, the eventual users of your code uh, um, deploy a, a more secure cloud. And um, so the call to action here for developers is, you know, follow the guidelines and reviewers, um, you know, use them as a checklist to review. And if you're an expert in this area, by all means, contribute to these guidelines. Uh, it's, it's open source, and it's, uh, it's in Git and Garrett, and you can contribute just like anything else. Um, in addition to human reviewers, uh, the OpenStack security team has also come out with a tool called Bandit. And it'll scan Python code looking for violations of best practices of security. And it'll flag right away if you do some things that make your code vulnerable to SQL injection or if you didn't validate input appropriately. It looks for a, a long list of, uh, of security violations. And that's a great tool to use. And I don't want to steal um, their thunder. There's some presentations later this week on Thursday. Uh, there's um, Bandit at 1.30 on Thursday and Secure Programming at 2.20. So if this type of stuff interests you, uh, definitely hit those uh, 
those sessions. And in the meantime, check out that guideline. And if you're writing code for OpenStack, please follow the guidelines. Um, so at this point, we've got secure OpenStack code. We need to install it somewhere. And we want to install it on, on a hardened Linux operating system. And one way to harden it is through access control. So access control is basically a policy of, of who can do what. And there's two general types of access control. The one that you typically see that we're used to is called discretionary access control. Uh, you create a file, and it's up to you to assign permissions to that file. Who can read it? Um, you start off, and, and it's just the owner can read it, and then there's some problem, so it's like, I've got to fix. I'll just change permissions to world access, and now it works, and then I'm not going to worry about the security. Um, also discretionary, so, so the user, in, in a way, can shoot himself in a foot by um, being too permissive and setting things himself. Um, also in Linux, Linux, this is usually uh, pretty coarse grained. You've got sudo that can do anything, and then you've got your users that can just access his own files. Um, uh, a more uh, appropriate way for an enterprise install of OpenStack is uh, mandatory access control. And in this case, it's not the users that define access to each resource, but it's the system. And it's the system administrator and it's policy that's actually installed um, when you install uh, software packages. And one implementation of this is, uh, is SC Linux, or Security Enhanced Linux. And it allows you to have very uh, fine-grained control of who can do what. And how this works, um, SE Linux has the decision engine, which lives inside the kernel of Linux, so it's uh, very performant. And you start off by every subject, uh, typically a process, will have a type. And then every, uh, every object or resource um, on the right is, is also going to have a type. And the object could be a file, it could be a uh, network access, it could be permissions to do something on the system. And then SE Linux maintains a database, essentially, of exactly who can do what within a system. And uh, in this case, let's say a subject such as the, the Nova controller process, he boots up and he wants to read his configuration file. So this read file request goes down. Um, it's intercepted by the SE Linux um, code inside the kernel, and he'll check his policy. Hey, is, is this process able to read this configuration file? And if yes, it's allowed to, uh, to happen. And if not, then it's rejected and it's logged. And this helps uh, strengthen um, the security of the cloud with the defense in depth. Um, so even if a hacker is able to break into your cloud, is maybe uh, sitting on a storage node, and he tries to access the user data, probably he won't be able to because that shell he launched um, is not going to have permissions to access any of the files on that system. So it provides an extra layer of defense. And let's see how this looks like in, a, uh, in the OpenStack world. Uh, so when you're running SE Linux, there's a dash capital Z, uh, which is, can be appended to most uh, standard Unix command. Um, so here's a list of Nova processes running uh, on my uh, OpenStack deployment. And you can see there's uh, very fine-grained access. Um, it's the, the third column over there on the left, you see there's a Nova console type, Nova scheduler type, Nova conductor type that matches the processes that are running. So it's not just a Nova user, but each process has specific permission. Uh, so in addition to each process, each file has a type. So here's the, the etsy nova directory, and you can see the configuration files have type etsy. Um, and so basically only processes that have specific permissions to read um, configuration files are going to be able to access these files. So somebody's not going to be able to hack in and, and dump the contents of your configuration files unless they, their process has that specific <coughs> permission. And in addition to protecting um, files, you also want to protect other things like network resources. So here's a list of listening ports uh, on an OpenStack deployment. And you see the sender has a type assigned for its port, Glance has a, uh, a, port, uh, a type assigned to its port, uh, Rabbit. So no one's going to be able to create these listening ports unless it's the actual process that has permission to do that. And no one's going to be able to write to these ports unless it has specific permissions to do that. So this makes uh, the, the cloud extra hack proof because you're not going to be able to talk to these resources unless you specifically have permission to do that. And so in addition to the, the permissions that are installed as, as um, you install any software package, there's also some extra fine-grained permissions that can be added later. And um, like just here in the, the, the second paragraph here, some extra permissions that are configured uh, in particular for Nova and the Nova processes that can use Memcache, for example. Um, only those three uh, process types are going to be able to, to do that, and none of the other ones will. And this is extra configuration steps that will make your, your cloud more secure. 
Uh, so the takeaways here, um, if you haven't used SE Linux before to just secure your cloud deployment, um, give it a try. It works. Uh, the guys at Red Hat support it at um, rdoproject.org, SE Linux. Um, I say it works. If it turns out it doesn't work, um, uh, SE Linux issues, you can report it. And uh, it gives you extra defense and depth for your, for your cloud. So at this point, we've got secure software running on a secure operating system. Um, let's see how, more, how further we can uh, secure our cloud. And let's look at the data. And to protect our data, we want to encrypt it. And uh, as a security advocate, it's in my job description that I have to say, encrypt everything. Um, encrypt uh, your data in transit. I want you to use TLS when you connect any two things um, over IP. And then encrypt your data at rest. Um, Swift, why not have encrypted objects, sender? Um, encrypted volumes, glance, encrypted images. Um, Nova, encrypt your image, your, your memory when you're not actively using it. So, um, you know, we're not there yet. Um, if most of us, if we have a cloud deployed, we don't encrypt everything. And there's some various reasons why. You know, an operator has to decide, you know, what's the sensitivity of my data? What's the risk of a breach? And then what's the complex complexity and risk involved of deploying this encryption? And uh, you know, technically, what's the big stumbling block? Uh, what's the challenge for, for encryption? And the answer is key management. Um, it's pretty easy to encrypt something, but if somebody else has to decrypt it, you have to have a key somewhere. You know, there's no mat to, to hide the key for, uh, for Nova to find. And um, the good news for OpenStack, for key management, there's an answer to this. And OpenStack has key management as a service, and that's uh, the project Barbicon. And in a nutshell, here's kind of how Barbicon works. And it's the same as any other OpenStack service. If you want to um, if you get your secret or your key, you'll uh, first authenticate with Keystone or your authentication service with your credentials, and you get back a token. And then if you want to get your decryption key from Barbicon, you send it a request, send it your token, and um, Barbicon will verify with Keystone that your token's valid for that particular secret, and then we'll pass you back your secret or your key. And this can uh, open up lots of different use cases. You can do, uh, by distributing keys in this friendly way, you can um, uh, enable server-side encryption. You can enable uh, TLS more broadly because you can uh, uh, manage certificates in their life cycle and a lot of other use cases. And uh, to help keep your secrets secure, uh, Barbicon supports a number of different uh, plugins in the back end. You can use uh, you know, dog tag, some other CAs, and it's extensible to, uh, to HSMs and other plugins. And so I don't want to steal their thunder because there's some more uh, Barbicon sessions later this week. But uh, if key management is something that interests you, if you want to use that to secure your cloud, uh, definitely hit one of the sessions or both on, uh, on Wednesday and, uh, and Thursday. So I think encryption in general as, uh, as a widespread use in OpenStack, I think we, are, we have a way to, to go. I think we as a community can work together. And uh, I think Barbicon can be a tool for that. So. Um, if you work on an OpenStack project that has key management needs, check out Barbicon and, uh, and let's work to, uh, to integrate uh, key management with all the different OpenStack projects. Um, so the hot topic today, does everybody know what that is? Containers, containers. So I have to mention containers today because it is literally the topic of the day. So, um, so that's the question, what's up with containers and security? So has anyone tried Googling container security? Um, so I did, and the first thing I get is a lot of links about these type of containers, of course. <laughs> and the links are kind of scary, to be honest, right? There are lots of stuff about you know, border control and customs and, and homeland security if you're from the US. And they're basically saying that things can be smuggled into and out of countries, and we don't know what they are because they're just inside these containers. And it's like, so I'm scared already, and I don't even have any relevant links. So. <laughs> So I'll uh, improve my security, uh, my, my web search a little bit, and I'll add LXC or, or Linux or something to, to container security. But I'm still scared because I'm hitting all these security blogs, and all these security bloggers are saying things like, well, containers don't contain, and different containers on a system will share a kernel. Um, all the tenants can access the infrastructure directly, and it's, it's not intended for multi-tenant. And um, this is sort of nuts. You know, what, what's going on here? <laughs> You know, and if you think about it, if somebody just read all those security blogs and then they were plopped into the conference today and heard all the buzz about containers, they're really confused. You know, what, what really is going on here? So I've allotted about two minutes to sort this out. Um, and so the first thing uh, I'll say about containers is there's lots of different use cases about containers. And so if you're going to judge whether or not uh, a container has the correct security profile for your use case, you're really going to have to define what that use case is and what that... Um, 
deployment of containers are. So um, we'll talk about, um, actually my favorite version of containers is a nice simple boot to Docker. Um, this is something that's really easy just to get something quick running. Um, so I'm a, a Barbican contributor and I haven't seen John this week, but uh, another contributor of Barbican has put together a container that contains a Keystone deployment. And in one container there's Keystone and all its dependencies and an operating system and a configuration for Keystone. It's got a service token, it's got a bunch of users, and two commands on my laptop, and I've got Keystone running on my laptop, which is perfect for a development environment. It's like, that's terrific. Um, I wouldn't use that in production. I uh, wouldn't use that for a public cloud, but, um, but you know, for a development environment, it's pretty cool. But, you know, so what, what is the security implications here? And the first thing is, is what, you know, I trust John, and that's good, but so through that, so I would not use a container for somebody I didn't know, right? Just like you wouldn't unload, you know, download a random application and run it on your, your laptop without vetting it. You know, use that same set of common sense for, uh, for containers. And then the other thing that I think uh, containers should use more of is insist on signed containers. You know, if somebody hacked into John's you know, Docker Hub account and replaced his Keystone image with a different one that had some malware, then I could wind up with malware on my laptop and that would not be good. So. Uh, I think we should all get into the practice of that if we're going to be building containers and sharing containers. Hey, let's, let's go through the extra step of getting a PGP key and, and hashing and signing our containers so, um, so other people can know that what we've, what we've given out, uh, what you've downloaded, is actually what we intended you to download and install. Um, another use case uh, of using containers for deployment is Kala. So Kala is a, a, a StackForge project, and it's also, um, just like my boot to Docker example, it is uh, an example of using containers for installing OpenStack. And this is kind of cool too. Um, in this case, you take OpenStack and you break it up into microservices. You've got maybe Nova, Keystone, Neutron, and then you define those as, um, as microservices of OpenStack. And instead of downloading <coughs> the source code directly and all the dependencies one at a time and installing that, put it all into a container. And uh, if I want to build a cloud, you know, download the appropriate containers, install the appropriate containers, and now my cloud's running. So that's kind of cool. Um, you know, is this secure? And it's, well, what we're doing is we're using containers to replace native processes. So that, that you know, passes the smell check. I haven't made security any worse by putting the OpenStack microservices into containers. So that's pretty good. Um, have we made security better? And maybe a little bit, because what we've done is we've made um, install of a service or upgrade of a service an atomic operation which is kind of good because that makes it simple and predictable and simple and predictable is good for security. So uh, I'll give that a thumbs up. Um, but I still have the same concern as with the boot to Docker example. So if you, if you have a distributor that's building containers for you, uh, insist on signed containers and make sure that you trust uh, the, the, the distributor of the call of containers. And do a quick, uh, quick hit for one more um, container example, and that's Magnum. Uh, that was part of the keynote this morning. I'm sure there was other sessions uh, during the day about Magnum. And Magnum is not an installation shortcut, but is actually, you know, containers as a service uh, managed by Nova. So this is Nova in addition to, to being able to launch virtual machines for you. This is Nova also being able to launch containers for you. And these containers contain your cloud op, um, applications. So this is exactly what those security bloggers, you know, warned us about. So that's got me concerned a little bit. But, you know, checking into the, the, the Magnum uh, solution, um, they do one thing right. Um, you know, they call them pods or bays, but essentially instances. When you say launch uh, my container, it'll schedule that container to run on a particular instance. And it makes sure that for one tenant, all of their containers are bundled on top of one resource with one kernel. And if you had, there's another tenant, he's gonna be running on a different instance with a different kernel. So you don't have that shared kernel problem. So that's pretty good. So um, it's, they're, they're thinking about it, which is good. And, and that's the main takeaway. So there's lots of container use cases. Uh, I'm not running scared yet, because I, I see that people are thinking about it, but you know, definitely be careful and do your homework. And if you have a particular use case and a particular deployment in mind, yeah, make sure it matches. And uh, just to cry out to everybody, you know, definitely um, don't download and run random containers. Let's, uh, let's all get in the practice of uh, practicing safe compute. Um, also, I want to uh, plug a talk on uh, Thursday if you want to dive a little bit deeper into uh, Docker containers in a trusted model. Uh, there's a talk Thursday at uh, 2.20 to, to deep dive into that. And then, um, so everything up until now, uh, we've talked about um, uh, deploying a cloud, operating a cloud, 
um, that type of thing. So let's talk about security from a, a user's perspective. Um, so application tiers. So if I'm a cloud application developer, um, the model on the left, this is how I think of uh, my application as I develop it. I think of these different tiers. Um, I might typically have a, a web server tier, which sits in front, which talks to an application tier below that. And then um, the back end it all, we've, I've got my database tier. And I'm thinking about these things are loosely layered, but they're scalable because I want to have you know, lots of them. Um, uh, I want to have, uh, want it to be resilient and fault tolerant, so I want some load balancing. Um, so this is sort of, I've, I've got some dependencies in mind, I've got some properties in mind, but I don't care about things like broadcast and multicast, I don't care about IP addresses. But then I go to my Neutron dashboard to configure the network that I need, and I'm confronted with routers and networks and subnets and IP addresses, and it's, it's, not, what, it's not what I want, it's not what I'm thinking about. So there's a, there's a layer of complexity here, a layer of complexion of complication, which can lead to mistakes, and mistakes lead to security holes. Uh, so, what can be done about this? And one answer to this is group-based policy. So, uh, group-based policy is a StackForge project, and what it is, it's an interface for capturing application intent. So, it's an interface that captures the things that I just talked about. Um, if I want to define the relationship between um, a web group and a database group, I'm going to have a set of rules, and the rules are going to be. Um, only my, my web group can talk to my database group. You know, that's a pretty good rule. Uh, let's say I want to have a, of a secure database group. So I say, okay, let's you know, drop a firewall in there. Um, I want to have a highly available database group. So boom, drop a load balancer in there. And this is how um, you know, cloud application developers think, and this is the kind of interface that they would really like. And what group-based policy does after you define these relationships and these rules it, ha it talks uh, then to the Neutron driver, and the Neutron does the heavy lifting of turning that into subnets and firewall as a service and, uh, and load balancer in instances. And that makes it really handy. And by uh, abstracting these policies, by automating them, um, it supports uh, all the interfaces you'd expect, uh, CLI, dashboard, or uh, through heat for your, your automation. Um, so group-based based, group -based policy makes it easy to deploy the application security that you want. and um, that makes it less error prone and therefore more secure. And it, you saw it made sense in a simple case. In a more complicated case, you might have a bunch of existing applications. Uh, you have three tiers. Um, all you need to do is you set your rules for each of them, and then uh, group-based policy will turn that into configuration for you. Um, so my takeaways here is, um, hey, it simplifies your configuration. It's going to make it less error prone. And then the errors is what leads to, uh, to security breach. And if you're interested in this, uh, there's a couple talks. Uh, Wednesday, 520 is a, is a user session. Uh, some IT guys took a bunch of their existing enterprise workloads, they migrated it to OpenStack, and they used group-based policy to make it really easy for them to, to get that up and running uh, quickly. So I recommend that one. And then Thursday, there's a hands-on lab. So if you want get, to uh, get your hands dirty, uh, configuring, running that, uh, definitely check out that session um, Thursday at 11. OK, so up until now, I've talked about just software. And um, our, the cloud has to run on something, right? So there's hardware there, too. So if we're talking about defense in depth, defense at every part, we need to talk about the hardware, too. And um, it's an interesting marriage between the two, because with the cloud, you've got lots of great things, lots of flexibility, <coughs> things available on demand. Uh, you've got broad access. You've got resource pooling, uh, rapid elasticity. I want that flexibility of the cloud. But then we're looking at hardware, and from a security point of view, hardware is really, really interesting because it's you know, relatively immutable. It's got a very small attack service, very reliable behavior, and a lot of times it's certified. You have FIPS certification or other government certifications. And it's really <coughs> cool if you can take the properties of both of those and marry them together. And to talk about this, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Raghu Yuluri from Intel to talk about some interesting things that Cisco and Intel have done um, recently to make the cloud more secure. Hey, thanks. Sure. Hey, I'm told that I'm between you and alcohol and meals, so <laughs> I'll keep it to three slides, hopefully. Okay. Uh, I work in our data center security products group, and I do a lot of security architecture and development. And uh, this, I really like this slide that uh, Dave put together. Okay, cloud plus Intel hardware, end of story. Okay, I don't think it's that easy, right? You know, the last three years, four years, Intel has been focused on one thing, okay? We want to bring what is called integrity assurance or trust assurance to OpenStack clouds for all the compute platforms. Compute could be 
just your standard compute workload, storage, network, anything. Okay, uh, we are continuing to enhance that integrity assurance up the stack. We want to make sure that as a tenant, your workload, your VM is integrity protected. Forget what the service provider, you trust the service provider, you have the visibility to what the integrity there is. But as a workload, you want to protect the integrity and confidentiality of it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, hey, your platform is trusted, keep going up the stack as high as we can, VMs, workloads, apps. Okay, next 10 minutes, that's what I'm gonna talk about. There are three primary use cases that we are trying to enable. Okay, the first one is trusted boot. Having the assurance that your workloads at a service provider are in fact running on trusted infrastructure. The hardware is trusted, the firmware is trusted, the BIOS is trusted, the OS and the hypervisor are trusted. Having that visibility, having that assurance is number one for a tenant. Okay, it's called trusted boot and it's been part of OpenStack for about two to three years now. Started in the Folsom release, we have the right extensions into OpenStack to make this happen. So uh, there should be no reason why you shouldn't use this on your specific OpenStack private cloud implementations. Okay, when you, if you are asking someone else to provide you the cloud, you should insist that they enable trusted blue in their OpenStack clouds. Okay, the next thing we did on top of it is we said, hey, there are very many regulated applications, things that need to get control where they run, where they migrate. Maybe they are PCI DSS apps, maybe they are HIPAA related apps, maybe they are just apps that need to have data sovereignty and workload sovereignty. So we enabled what is called geotagging or asset tagging in hardware, whereby you can do what is called boundary control now. You can say through policy, this workload will only run in this geography. And the OpenStack scheduler is gonna control that for you. If you're trying to migrate outside, it's gonna say, hey, you violated a policy and it's not gonna let you violate. But now the question is, how about the storage volumes that go with that? Yeah, your VM may be running in Germany, but it could be mapping a storage volume that's somewhere else. So we took the same approach we did for the Nova scheduler to the Cinder scheduler as well. So we wrote extensions to the Cinder scheduler, which will ensure that when you're creating a storage volume or when you're attaching a storage volume, when you're migrating a storage volume, it's gonna enforce the same geo policy. It's gonna say, hey, this VM and this storage volume need to be in this geography. You can't map them if they don't come in the same geography. You can do that and it's enforced in hardware and it's attested in hardware. Okay, this is not upstream into OpenStack yet. We, we, we tried to upstream it into Kilo. There's a lot of activity in the community on this whole geotagging and boundary control pieces. Uh, we are hoping that it gets into Liberty. Okay, and the reason is simple. Okay, these are changes to schedulers. And uh, the OpenStack community is not interested to put any new features into Nova. They would rather fix the 1500 bucks that are there in Nova today. Uh, all this is good, okay, it's giving you the assurance up to the OS, the hypervisor level. But now you are a tenant, you're hosted by somebody else. How do you protect your workloads? Okay, that's where the last one comes, what we call tenant controlled uh, workload protection. Okay, when you take an image and you put it with the service provider, you encrypt it and you put it in glance. The stuff that Dave was talking about, encrypting images in glance. But the key is you own the keys in your enterprise. The key management system is residing with you. Okay, you, when a time comes when you want to launch the image, the OpenStack controller moves that uh, request to a specific compute node somewhere. Before Nova launches that VM image, it's gonna have to ask you the key management system that's residing in your tenant, hey, I need the decryption key for this image so that I can launch it. 
And the key management system is going to have what we call trust-based retrieval of keys. The service provider has to prove to you that VM is being launched on a trusted server. That the server is trust booted, it's in the right geography, it has all the appropriate compliance requirements before the key management system releases the key. Not only that, it's going to release the key wrapped in the hardware rooted key. It's in the TPM. So it doesn't matter anybody gets the packets in the middle, they can't do anything with it. The private key is in the TPM on that server. That's the only entity that can decrypt that one. So the VM is on a server. The TPM decrypts that one after we know that it's a trusted server, and then it launches that VM image on that server. So the only time the image is in the clear is when it's running on that machine. This can be VM images. It could be data. It could be anything else. But we are taking the workload confidentiality protection away from the service provider, putting it in the hands of the tenant. So even if a subpoena comes to the service provider, they can't do anything there because the keys are still in the enterprise. Okay? This is what we announced a couple of days ago. It's called Cloud Integrity Technology 3. It's available in uh, beta form right now with the launch in June. Uh, it's going to work with Icehouse to start with. And uh, it's going to be for Juno as well as for Kilo. Okay. Uh, there are demos of this at the Intel booth, so definitely urge you guys to go take a look at it. Okay. Of course, I can't finish any talk at this summit without talking about containers. We are, ex we are doing the same exact thing, the same model for containers. And there's a talk on Thursday at 2.20. I'm going to talk about trusted Docker containers and VMs in OpenStack Cloud. The stuff that Dave talked about, having the same control plane, which is OpenStack. How can you orchestrate trusted containers and trusted VMs it's very transparently? That's what's going to be the talk on Thursday. So if you have interest in that one, do come for that. Okay? Now, Intel and Cisco have been collaborating on this project called White Lightning. Okay? Uh, Raphael is here, yeah. He's the guy from Cisco. If you want to know more about White Lightning, he's the sponsor of that from Cisco. And the idea was to take everything that we did in hardware, the trusted VM stuff that you saw before, and have that applicable to the various cloud services that Cisco is building. Whether it is infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or even the SaaS services that they're going to build. Okay. Uh, and the interesting thing about white lightning, it goes beyond the standard TPM as the root of trust. There are many Cisco appliances, Cisco devices that don't use TPM. They have a different hardware root of trust. So we are trying to explore ways to take the same concepts of trusted VMs but apply to all the Cisco devices. Okay? The way this would manifest, if I can kind of show you a little complicated chart here, we are doing current attestation on the bottom for uh, OS, VMM, VMs, geotags, all that stuff. But we are extending that for IoT devices and the switches and routers from Cisco as well. So a very uniform hardware route of trust, a very uniform attestation model, a very uniform trust model that goes across x86 hardware, routers, switches, any of the IoT gateways and IoT devices. That's the goal of the White Lightning project. Okay? We are not there all the way, but that's where we are driving to with the Intel-Cisco combination on this one. Okay? So the key summary from my side before we uh, have Dave back here is use hardware as a way to provide you a route of trust. Okay? Uh, hardware by itself is not going to be enough. You need attestation solutions. You need trust solutions. Intel's providing those. They are going to be integrated into OpenStack. There's already a lot of integration happening. So at the end of the day, where we want to be is having cloud management software like OpenStack seamlessly use the security primitives that are in hardware so that you as a tenant with your workloads don't have to worry about infrastructure security, infrastructure integrity. That's the goal. Okay? 
Right, with that, uh, Dave, uh, come on up, and if you guys have any questions, anything that we can answer together, we'd yep. be happy to do so. Yes? Uh, today is 1.2, but we are very actively moving to 2.0. Hi, uh, Marshall Michel Nist. Um, we have a question because we are trying to uh, figure out how to prevent applications running on the stack to attack one another, uh, access data securely. So uh, you addressed that earlier, and I'd be interested in learning more uh, about how to do that exactly. For SE Linux, or just in general, or? Uh, so far we have a Ubuntu Linux, so we can install SE on top, but. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not sure I understand like the specific question. Okay, but so, uh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. what, what we're trying to do is we have applications that are uh, coming into our stack. We want to be able to run them independently from one another. They have access to a, to a common pool of data. Some of them can be a second step into a multi-step application, but they're coming from different sources. Uh, we want to ensure that applications are not able to uh, access data from one another, uh, uh, not phone home, and at the same time, uh, we want to ensure that uh, any communication through our storage, uh, I mean, we're obviously using encryption and TLS for data transfer, but we want to make sure how, how can we make ensure that none of the data goes out and none of the application can attack one another. So we, the idea would, would have been to run into a, an air gap container, but not sure exactly what's the best solution. And since you've addressed that earlier, I'd be... I'd love to hear, to hear more, obviously. Yeah, I think the, the weak point I heard there, you said they were, they were sharing you know, common data, mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's the problem, is that they, they should be maybe separate volumes defined by sender, and mm -hmm. the different applications would be part of different projects, so they would have access to, to different areas of, of data. So when you think about it, what they need to do is they need likely to uh, talk to one another. The, the way we are thinking of doing that right now is using Go channels mm -hmm. uh, for them to basically uh, uh, communicate information from one application to one another, but not enable the application itself to uh, break uh, the air gap. Uh, oh. And uh, therefore, I'm, I'm still trying, obviously, to, to figure out a better, uh, a, ni uh, a nicer solution. You know, yep. it's just uh, it's just right now we're still thinking about it. So it's a good opportunity for me to ask a question. Okay. We'll talk later, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. For that side, we have a mic right there. Is it on? So, uh, Dave, you mentioned about TLS and a couple of use cases there, right? So, one of the things I'd like your input on is uh, the use of TLS between the service, you know, service to service transport uh, comes with, you know, HTTP. Uh, you know, number one is, you know, your feedback on the importance of using service to service TLS and if you had that experience with any kind of performance tax once that's applied. Yeah, um, the, my experience on that is, is sort of theoretical. Um, I know some people have tried it, and, and they usually do it by um, deploying S tunnel or some other form of offload to, to front the different services instead of using the native services. And uh, I know some people have solved the problem, but, but it's a difficult one. And, uh, yeah. So you've spoken a lot about how you are guaranteeing that a VM that I'm going to run is actually the VM that I intend to run. Mm -hmm. Uh, using you know TPM and trusted root in the hardware. What are you doing about applications that are running? I have an application that's running in memory, and you know it has a vulnerability. It has a zero-day vulnerability, and somebody is causing a stack overflow uh, or some other means of attacking that application. So, what are you doing about runtime integrity of applications? Okay, uh, one of the most actively worked projects at Intel is to do runtime integrity protection. Okay. But the problem with that is, I'm, I'm sure you know this, it is not an easy computer science problem to solve, okay? If I build a watcher that's gonna monitor my hypervisor, probably 50% of the CPU is gonna go run the watcher as opposed to doing useful work, okay? Now the question is, what can we really do to take small baby steps in that direction? There are a lot of ideas, things like, hey, can we uh, protect the, the interrupt descriptor tables, the global descriptor tables, to make sure that they are not tampered with, okay? Uh, the other thing that we are looking at, I'm sure you heard of a technology called SGX from Intel, mm -hmm. Secure Enclaves, yep. uh, Secure Guard Extensions, I guess, is the uh, marketing name for it. That will give you the guarantee that 
even if the OS is tampered, there is hardware, proportion, uh, hardware protection to layers of memory. So everything that's in memory is going to be encrypted at all time, and hardware controls that one. Uh, that is, at least on servers, it is 2017 and beyond. But once SGX is available, we can do a lot of the stuff that you are talking about. Your app has some secrets, they're in memory, they can be within these secure enclaves that uh, the OS cannot, cannot control. Okay. Okay. Until okay. then, runtime integrity is a, is a tough challenge for everybody. Okay, uh, I'll stop by and talk to you after. Sure. We've got time for one more. Any other? Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, my question is on one of the slides. You mentioned GBP as being able to enforce uh, service function chaining, and um, it is not available today at all in Neutron. So can you elaborate a little bit what you think is available today and what may be available later on? Um, I'd recommend the, uh, the, the GBP session tomorrow. That, yeah, I, uh, okay, so it's, it's definitely not part of Neutron as of now, correct? I, I'm, I don't know. Okay, because you yeah. showed it in the slides, so I wasn't yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I stole someone else's slide. Yeah. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Uh, only All right. how quickly on, they can, the how quickly they can yes. get to the yeah. beer, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.